Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, folks. Michael Zuber, one rinse all at a time, back with the one and only Anna Kelly. How are you doing, Anna? I'm doing great. Happy Wednesday. Happy Wednesday. I always love talking to you each week. Uh, I thought we should talk about Mark Zandi. Mark Zandi yeah. is in the news today. Uh, he has been changing his opinion on housing seemingly every day. Uh, today, I read an article, and we will bring up one version of it. I'm sure there's lots of others where he is basically saying, if the U.S. hits a recession, which I think you and I both think is highly likely, that the national housing market could see a housing crash of 15 to 20 percent. I think all of us believe there will be some markets that experience that. I think calling for a housing crash of 20 percent, even in a recession, because we've had recessions the last 50 years, right. um, is, uh, is an interesting call. And I think Mark is doing this because he got so burned by being so wrong in 06, 07, and 08. He was on the other side and missed it. So I think he's a little gun shy. But uh, wh what do you think when Mark Zandi uh, from, I think it's Moody's Analytics, starts talking housing crash? Yeah, you know, I've been tracking Moody's Analytics really carefully this year and watching um, the way that they come up with their predictions. And what I will say is that you and I've talked several times on this show over this last year how certain markets have become extremely unaffordable, even compared to the national averages that we talked about in video number two. And so what they're doing is they're looking at what are the wages in the markets that have had the housing uh, values go up so much that their payments have gone up so much, where the underlying wages just don't support that, that sustained housing price and that sustained mortgage payment. And so they've been showing with changes every single month, which markets are over, you know, way overvalued and, and not sustainable and how much they think they're overvalued by. And what we're seeing now, I just looked at the report this morning, is the same markets that they were, he were saying, hey, we're a little worried about these markets. We're starting to see a huge decline in transactions, increase on days and in market. Some prices are already starting to soften in those markets. And so I think he's been tracking it very carefully you know, I wouldn't put it past him being right that in certain markets that are highlighted in the report, we could see values go down. You know, 25% is hard to imagine and hard to handle for most people. But, you know, already several markets are down 10% in terms of mm -hmm. their, their values. And so is it possible we could get down to 20 in many major metros? I, I think he's right, just based on the data that I see they've been tracking. Yeah, again, I think if you talk, if, if if you want to step back and say there's 10, 20, shoot, maybe 30 markets that could see between 10 and 20% drop peak to trough, right? I think that's a reasonable discussion where right. I think he is wrong. And, I, and again, I think it's some of this is because he was so wrong last time. He's talking national. Let me bring up the article yeah. at least quotes him and uh, we'll talk about it. And, yeah. then, uh, and I didn't get to read the whole thing. I just kind of looked at where, you know, where the, the cities were. I do think that he's, he's probably a little too bearish, um, you know, a little too the sky is falling in terms of nationwide, because we also have a severe housing shortage in many areas of the country, especially where we've seen a lot of population moving like into the Sun Belt, for example. So I, I think, you know, just like any time, Real estate is very regional and different areas of the country have different levels of financial health before you go into a crisis that are going to you know, cause the supply and demand fundamentals to be different region by region, city by city. Yeah, just to highlight, this is where I'm referring to. This is Mark Zandi, Moody's uh, Analytics. He's calling for it if we have a recession of 15 or 10 to 15 percent. The art, other articles I've read said 10 to 20 percent. But yeah. You know, one of the things that um, I'm sure Mark appreciates, but I, I think there's two things. I think the, the biggest thing is, and I get a lot of pushback for my opinion on housing because people are like, Michael, you know, <laughs> one guy said I should, I should give my degree back to my university because I don't understand basic supply demand. So <laughs> that's because that's they learn supply demand from a university, not from the real world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, they're basically like, Michael, if demand falls, prices have to fall. And I'm like, okay, let me give you an analogy that you could appreciate, mister. If you're Target and you have all of these TVs on the shelf and nobody's buying them, 
Yes, you have to lower price to spur demand. But I ask you, Anna, what happens if the TVs don't show up on the shelf? What do you have to do then? You don't have enough. So people are, 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 are scared. They're afraid that scarcity, they got to buy it. And what will they do? They'll just pay more for it. So you limit supply and you can also you know, impact prices. So that's the key to supply demand. And this is why I think most people are wrong. Um, because most people who are quasi armchair economists only look at demand. Right. That's the easiest thing to understand. We did video number two on affordability. That's all demand based. As somebody who has an econ degree, multiple levels of it and an MBA, I can look at supply. And I think we are going through phase two of the housing crash right now. We are going to see supply destruction like 1980 and 81, where transactions went down 50. This is the land of Robert Allen, no money down, 1980 bestseller. This is what's coming. There yeah. will be transactions. They'll be done differently. Absolutely. And it's Again, people are so focused on demand, so focused on affordability. We've already done the math. It's the worst or second worst ever. I agree. Right. That's only part one of a two part problem. Absolutely. And I think a couple of things on the supply side is number one, very, very different from, you know, the 2008 housing crisis is most people, I think it's over 80% of mortgages are sub 4% for 30 year fixed. So we do not have this situation where people are in their homes, the value goes down, they panic and they try to sell driving down you know, prices because of a, a huge wave of supply, you have people that are saying, there is no way I'm going to move and give up my house. I can't, you know, go up. I'm not the, you know, the, the move up buyer. Those transactions are slowing down. But who do you think is going to sell their house unless they have to, to trade up into a house that's more expensive today for less square footage? And oh, by the way, the mortgage interest rate is double. We saw on your spreadsheet that you did a number two, that the mortgage payment more than doubles for the same house today than it did before. So you're going to see a mass amount of people that just decide, you know what, we're staying put. You know why? Because now their mortgage is an asset, Michael, and people don't think about that. Having a 30-year exactly. fixed mortgage at the lowest rates in history, when rates may be much higher in the future, literally is an asset. It's an advantage. So why sell? And and that's going to keep prices from plummeting too far in exactly. most markets where supply and demand have already been fairly balanced or where there's already been limited supply. And this is exactly why most markets, in my opinion, will be okay, but also why Phoenix and Las Vegas can be crushed because they have these poor business models called iBuyers who are in desperate need to sell yeah. unless they pivot. Phoenix, you're in trouble, right? The last time I checked and I had a Phoenix broker on the other day, uh, I think it was 18% of the active listings were um, one of the iBuyers. They eventually have to sell out. And then they're, they're to me, iBuyers on are just like the banks in 2011, 12. Somebody sits at a computer screen, has an Excel spreadsheet and says, one, two, three main streets been listed for 90 days. Take the first offer blow it out. It's just reserved for bad debt and they're on their way. But that too will end, right? right? They're not doing as much buying. So that once that's gone, it's gone. But most of the country is not skewed by iBuyers. And again, right. people are, prices are sticky. It's called price inelasticity. Look it up, folks who, who, don't, who think I make it a bad call. Um, yeah. Prices don't drop. And again, most people at this point, I'm saying phase two housing crash goes to March 15th. Uh, because of supply destruction. I'm just not going to sell. And also, if you're nervous, if you're nervous about your job, are you really interested in trading up? Nope. Uh, yeah. And then lastly, your point about forced sellers. I want you to play this out. Let's pretend unemployment goes to 10%. We're at 3.7. How fast could we get to 10%? Maybe six months, nine months, 12 months? I think it'd take even longer than that. Yeah, that's a so huge let's, increase. Let's say it's 12 months. All right, now we're at 10%. Now there's real people that can't make their payments. Well, there's the old way of doing it. You miss your payment for 90 days, then you get an NOD, and then it takes 1,000 days to get you out, which is almost three years. Or there's the new way. You have, go to the website and say, I need forbearance, and you get six yeah. months. So again, this whole 
hope of REOs and short sales coming back aren't coming back for years. Best case. Right. I, I agree with you. And one other thing about the iBuyers as well, it's just over 1% of all transactions are iBuyers. So it's not like, you know, they bought up 20, 30%. They're going to have to sell at pennies on the dollar for everything. Now their margins are very, very slim. I read this morning, the average iBuyer open door capital, for example, they, they have a 5% margin for profit, which isn't very much when prices go down even five or 10%. And so what they've done though, Michael, to your point is they've bought a lot of cookie cutter build to rent kind of homes in the same neighborhoods in the same major cities like Phoenix, like Austin, for example. And because they're trying to sell a bunch at one time, they're not getting enough of them sold. So it, it's them that's that's increasing the supply and having to take a loss. And they are going to take some losses. But by and large, generally speaking, um, you know, real estate, I don't think is going to crash 20%. I do think that in certain markets, we're already seeing a decline of 10. So getting, you know, a decline of 15 to 20 in those particular markets is definitely in the realm of possibility. Um, so, you know, know your market, know what the fundamentals are of your market, right? Can the wages support the, you know, price of a home? And if not, if people can't afford to buy the house, even if the price is coming down because of the mortgage payment, what are they going to do? They're, they're going to rent, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think, again, one of the things that's going to go on is I think eventually rates will come down. And just like today, where people go 7%. I want four, <laughs> maybe a year from now. They're like, Oh, 6.1, 5.99. God, it's not eight anymore. I feel great. People have these weird memories. Right. And you know, you know, the 4% mortgage will be forgotten in a year and it'll be, Oh my God, I'm not paying eight. I mean, I remember the first time I got a, a sub six loan. That was crazy. So again, we'll, we'll forget the fours. We'll remember the eights. We'll go the other way. So. It's just, it's going to be a fun, it will take a long time to unpack. This is, this is not the stock market that readjusts, uh, you know, PE ratios and, and multiples so quickly. So it's, it's, no, it's going to be a slow It, it definitely mess. takes time, right. For recovery as your spreadsheet on video number two shows, you know, it could be a decade before housing gets affordable again. And it just, it, it depends on a lot of things, but, you know, as real estate investors, we really play for the long haul. And so, you don't have to worry, what is the value of my property today? So much as you just have to say, what kind of debt do I have? Can rent support the debt? Can I continue you know, to preserve capital and, and let this thing pay down its mortgage over time, hold it for the long term? And, and you, you have to basically dollar cost average your purchases in real estate. So plan to hold them, make sure that the numbers work no matter when it is you're buying, right? So if interest rates are higher, you got to buy the property for less or you got to be able to really cut expenses or raise rents to make it profitable. When interest rates are low, maybe prices are super high like they were last year. So you can make money in all real estate markets. You just have to know what a good deal looks like. And like you always say, what is a great deal? Only do great deals. They're still out there, right? And there may be more opportunity for really great deals as those who are selling are more motivated now than they were a year, year and a half ago. Absolutely, Anna. Thank you for the time this week. Where can people find you? Great. You can find me on social media, Anna Kelly, REI Mom. You can find me on my website at reimom.com and on my playlist on your channel on YouTube. Thank you so much.